Hello and welcome to this look at um, uh, a longer answer uh, and quite applied question exploring various aspects of an unknown organic weak acid. It's question four from the OCR Unified Chemistry 2017 paper. So I'll take it a second at a time. First bit, it says the question is about weak acids and it's compound A is a weak monobasic acid. So it's worth taking a moment to think about what that means. So it means you get one hydrogen ion coming off. So this uh, equation we're going to use HA to represent acid A. It's, HA is, is a common way of representing um, a generic um, weak acid. So you can see that one hydrogen ion comes off per HA molecule. So it's worth bearing that in mind for later on in the question. So the information given in terms of what the student's doing, um, it needs uh, to be visualized. So sometimes it's quite easy to do this in your head, but I quite like doing a little sketch. So something along these lines, you could uh, do a sketch of this. It doesn't have to be sort of technically perfect or anything like that, just to help your brain process what is being described. So it says that the, the NaOH goes in the burette. So that must mean that the 25 centimeter cubed samples of the solution, the original 250 centimeter cubed, is what goes into the, um, the flask. So the next thing to do is to look at what we're required to do first. Record the students' readings and the titers in an appropriate format. So it's worth thinking about what appropriate format means. It tells you a bit further up that all burette readings are measured to the nearest 0.05 centimeters cubed. So that must mean that your titer has to be to two decimal places and must end in zero or five. So if we take each reading and I put it in a different color so that you can see where each reading ends up in the table. So that's not the only way it can be represented, but you need to actually record a table. The expectation from OCR is that a table has actual grid lines and column headings and units. So just to clarify um, why it's actually um, 0.45, sorry, a bigger pardon, um, 23.15. So I'm looking at this reading here and this reading here. So I'm just magnifying it a bit so you can see that the bottom of the meniscus sits halfway between 0 0.10 and 0 0.20, hence why it's 0.15. That allows us to highlight two concordant titers. It's a good idea to actually circle them to remind yourself to use them. You mustn't use all three titers, so use two concordant titers that agree within 0 0.10 centimeters cubed. And you average those out and you get 22.50. So it goes on to give us the structure of compound A. And it says it's got four optical, optical isomers. They want you to use this information and the students' results. So let's look at the information from before and also the students' results, which was 22.50. So they want us to determine the molar mass of A. So put in the equation for the reaction between HA and sodium hydroxide in the titration. And you can do a data moles equation moles answer type calculation. So we know that there's 25 centimeter cubed samples of our acid, so that goes there. And they know, or we know rather, that sodium hydroxide is in the burette and the concentration is 0 0.0840. And therefore, the 22.50 is the average or mean titer worked out before. So that means we can work out, because we have concentration and volume for sodium hydroxide, what the number of moles are. So I've um, put down the actual marking points in black so you can see them visually. So the first marking point is for working out the moles of sodium hydroxide. And in the equation, you can see it's a one-to-one -one ratio between A and sodium hydroxide. So therefore, the number of moles of A are going to be 1.89 times 10 to the minus 3. But that's in a 25 centimeter cube sample. The original sample was 250. So you multiply that up by 10 to get times 10 to the minus 2. 
So the molar mass of A is the mass over the moles that are present in that 250 centimeter cubed. So that gives us 132.0 grams per mole. So that's the molar mass of the whole thing. We now have to work out the formula of a section of it, of basically what this bit is here. So what you do is you take the part you do know and you add it all up and that gives us 75 grams per mole. So clearly that R part is going to be our total minus 75, which gives us 57 grams per mole. Now we know it's an alkyl group, so the only alkyl group that sits into that kind of um, uh, value is C4H9. And the next thing to do is to look at four optical isomers. What does that mean? So let's clear some space and have a think about that. So if there's four optical isomers, there must be two chiral carbons, because each chiral carbon will have two possible um, arrangements around it. So therefore, one chiral carbon will give two optical isomers, two chiral carbons will give four optical isomers. So now having, having a think about how C4H9 might fit on there, obviously this is going to be a chiral carbon, but there's going to be a chiral carbon within our R group. So this is your C4H9. The only way it can work is that you put it like that. So therefore, one group, two groups, the hydrogen that comes off here, and then all of this is your fourth group. So next it says uh, the structural formula of compound A is repeated below, and then two reactions of compound A are carried out. There's only one of them on the screen at the moment. I'll do the other one in a, in a couple of minutes. So the instructions tell us to suggest an equation for each reaction and state the type of reaction. And in your equations, draw structures for organic compounds. I'm going to park that thought and come back to it in a minute or so. So a bit of recall is needed here because magnesium ribbon is the same as magnesium metal. So it's added to a solution of compound A, which we know is an acid. So magnesium reacts with acids to make hydrogen and a magnesium salt. Now clearly there's a carboxylic acid group there, so it's the hydrogen in that carboxylic acid group that will come off as a proton and react with magnesium. So it's quite useful to maybe think about the ionic equation of what's going on to help you sort of construct your main equation. So the reason for that is because if you look at it closely, you can see that there's some information in the question. Gas bubbles are seen and the magnesium solely dissolves. And I've circled that part of the ionic equation. So Mg2 plus is the dissolved magnesium as, M, as magnesium 2 plus ions. And obviously the H2 as a gas is going to be the gas bubbles. Now, earlier on, it said that the question in the question that the acid was monobasic. If you remember, I did say it might be worth coming back to when I first came across that with you. So therefore, there's two H pluses. So that must mean that there's two moles of hydrogen ions. So therefore, two moles of acid A. So because there's not too much space at the bottom, I'm going to use structural formula, but you could just as easily use displayed or skeletal or combinations of those three. Now, why did I put redox as the type of reaction? Well, you could, if you wanted to, go and put oxidation numbers next to everything and work it through. But a good way of shortcutting that is to see if you have uncombined elements on either side. So, for example, the magnesium is uncombined on the left, but it's not uncombined on the right. And on the hydrogen, that's combined on the left, but uncombined on the right. So that generally tells you that redox is going on. So it's not an acid-base reaction because it's not magnesium hydroxide or magnesium carbonate, it's magnesium metal. So it might be tempting to put an acid-base reaction or a neutralization because it's an acid that's reacting. But don't forget that acids react with metals as well. That's why I said at the top maybe to recall that idea from year one. Now the final bit, I've put the um, compound A on screen. It's not in the, there in the question on the paper. You'd have to go back a couple of pages to have a look at it again. So it says it's heated with a few drops of concentrated sulfuric acid. Now that should 
be raising alarm bells in your head, thinking, ah, right, esterification, because that's the reagent condition you need. Seeing as in the compound, you have an alcohol and a carboxylic acid functional group. So they can react with each other, either directly or in two separate molecules of compound A. So the next thing to think about is what do they mean by cyclic dimer? Now, you're not expected at A level to know from recall what a dimer is. That's covered at university level chemistry. But if you think about cyclic, it means it's a ring structure, doesn't it? And di in dimer must mean that there's two of something. So if we take, for example, two moles of compound A, you can actually react the carboxylic acid of one with the alcohol of the other twice. And therefore, you can get a ring structure like this shows from the Mark scheme. So obviously, like we said, it's an esterification reaction. But also, because you've got water being removed, you could argue that it's condensation as well. OK, so quite a lot going on there in that question. Um, and thanks for making it to the end of a slightly longer than normal video. Until next time, uh, thanks for listening and see you soon.